Hey, I'm really pumped because uh, we are starting a new series this week. Um, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at the topic of prayer and particularly about how prayer is the way that us ordinary people communicate with an extraordinary God. Prayer is how ordinary people communicate with an extraordinary God. And prayer is something that is, I think, super critical and super important, super vital for us as people and followers of Jesus to understand. So over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at the heart of prayer, we're going to be looking at the power of prayer, and we're going to be looking at how the Lord's Prayer teaches us to pray, because Jesus did give us instructions on how we can best pray and communicate with our extraordinary God. So I'm pretty pumped for us to be doing that over the next few weeks, because I believe that When we understand prayer, the heart of prayer, the power of prayer, and how to pray, we will see prayer change our situations. We will see prayer bring our friends to faith in Jesus. We will see prayer transform us from the inside out. We will see prayer change our city, our schools, our nation. We will see God do incredible things through our prayers as we continue to know the heart, power, and how to pray. Uh, in our lives. So I'm pretty pumped for that. And obviously, seeing as we're doing the theme of prayer, uh, we should probably, before we get into it, pray. So would you join me uh, as we pray this morning? Lord, I just want to thank you so much for the fact that we can come together here and just um, just spend time uh, worshipping you, reflecting on what Jesus did on the cross, but also uh, learning about uh, your word and how we, as ordinary people, can communicate with you, an extraordinary God. And God, I pray this morning that uh, you would help Uh, take uh, these words and let them speak to our hearts. And Lord, I just pray right now that you would help us to listen to what it is that you have to say to us uh, today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, who here has a phone? Hands in the air if you have a phone. Hands in the air if you own a phone or have a phone. Yep, some of you even show me your phones. That's a lot of you have a phone. Now, how how old were you? Like, let me do a poll. How, if you were 13 when you got your phone, put your hands in the air. Like, yeah? All right. If you were 12 when you got your phone, put your hands in the air. If you were 11 when you got your phone, put your hands in the air. Did anyone get a phone when they were like 10? Nine? Eight? Seven? All right. Yeah. All right. So around like... People were getting them like super early. See, when I was your age, I didn't get a phone until I was like 16. No, no, that's right. No, but this is what you guys don't understand. I lived in the age before mobile phones were easily accessible. You don't understand what life looked like before that, do you? Who here was born before the year 2000? Before the year 2000. Exactly. None of you in this room were born before the year 2000. You don't know what the world looked like in the in the thousands. You know, you have no clue. And the world didn't have phones. Now, let me inform you about how different the world looked. See, when I would try and communicate with my friends, there was three ways that you could communicate them. You could communicate via home phone. You could communicate via MSN, or you could communicate via letter. Yeah? Letter. That's right. These were the three ways to communicate with people when I was growing up. Now, if I wanted to hang out with my friend, I would have to call them on the phone. And, you know, like the home phone, not the mobile phone, the home phone. You know, I would go on the phone and type in the number and then call and wait and see. And, you know, the chances are that you would get a parent or a sibling. It was the worst. You didn't know who you were going to get. And, you know, you'd get their mom and you'd be like, all right. Can I talk to Ryan? Ryan was my best mate at the time, so I often just called Ryan. Like, hey, Ryan, do you want to catch up? Like, you want to go play some tennis at 10.30? Um, Just, uh, you know, down at the tennis course? He'd be like, yep, let's go do that. We would go down there and play tennis at 10.30. And I would get there at 10.30. But Ryan was someone who was always late. So he would get to like 10.35 and Ryan was still not there. But do you know what you couldn't do? You couldn't text Ryan and be like, hey man, where are you? You had to sit and wait. You couldn't change your plans because you didn't know if Ryan was on his way and if you left, you'd miss him. Plus, your parents had dropped you off and you couldn't really, you know, go anywhere. So you were just chilling there. That was it. And if Ryan took half an hour to get there, you sat there for half an hour waiting for Ryan to get there. And you had no idea if Ryan was ever going to arrive. You didn't know if Ryan was dead. You didn't know if Ryan had got caught up with something else. You didn't know if Ryan had all of a sudden got grounded. You had no idea, no way to communicate with them. 
But not only that, if you went out on an adventure, which again, Ryan and I did all the time, we loved going out on bike rides, and you had a mishap, you couldn't call mum. Couldn't get on the texts and, you know, just ask a friend to come and pick you up. You had to wheel your bike back. So I remember one time, Ryan and I, we went out for a bike ride, and we were riding, 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 and Ryan just busted his chain. Not like, oh, it slipped off and I couldn't get it on. Like, it, the chain snapped. Like, you know, like it was, it was busted right up. And we were a fair way, from, um, fair way away from home. And so we had to walk around, and we had two options. We could either walk and knock on a stranger's door and ask them to use a home phone, or we could try and find a payphone. Now, does anyone in this room know what a payphone is? All right, good, most of you did. At 8.45, most of them didn't, so it was a really confusing thing trying to explain what one of them was. You know, like, a payphone is something that just sort of sits there and is in random locations. You have no idea where, they're just there. And there's not many of them around these days, but there was plenty of them when I was growing up. Now, a payphone works, you've got to put some money in it to obviously make the phone call. Now, if you didn't have any money, you could still use the payphone if you used 1-800-REVERSE. Do you guys know what 1-800-REVERSE is? A lot of, like, no's. So 1-800-REVERSE, let me explain what it is. You would go to a payphone, and you would type in 1-800 and then spell REVERSE, on like, you know, the payphone. You know how there's the little um, letters under the numbers? Yeah, so you would spell reverse, and then you, you would get someone and you'd be like, I just want to call this number. And you would call the number, say I was calling my parents, or in this case, Ryan was calling his mum. And he called his mum. On the other end of the phone, she picks it up and it says, this is a 1-800 reverse call, do you accept the charges? And she could say yes or no. So she could like, be like, nah, stuff you, and like hang up. Or she could say yes and accept the charges. And so she did, she accepted the charges. And, you know, Ryan said, hey, I busted my chain, you know, I need you to come and pick me up. And she said, no, you can just walk home. And so we had to walk the bike all the way home with a busted chain. But that was the only way we could communicate when those things happened. That was what life looked like before the mobile phone. Now you guys can text, call, Instagram, direct message, fa Facebook Messenger, Snapchat, WhatsApp. You, like, you could just do a social blast to make sure someone gets a message if you want to hang out with them. You know, you could do a Facebook status if you were really desperate. Hey, please come and hang out with me. You know, someone comment if you want to hang out. You know, like you guys can do all that sort of stuff these days. We had none of that. And I tell you, the day that I got my first phone was incredible. See, you guys aren't even going to understand this. The first phones were not iPhones. See, my first phone looked like this. That was my first phone. That was the Motorola L6. Now, Motorola was the phone company you want to have. Motorola, at the time, the most um, popular phone they had was this one, uh, not my one, the next photo of uh, Motorola Razr. Now, that was it. It was a flip phone, and it was a big deal because you could flip it out, and you could text, and it had a two megapixel camera, which is why the photo quality looks like that, because that was a Motorola Razr taking a photo of a Motorola Razr. Like, it was terrible. They were no, like, no good compared to today, but they were the big thing. And back in my day, you guys get credit, don't you? Is that right? Like, you guys, you're not on plans and all that sort of stuff. I don't know what kid... Oh, uh, is credit a thing? Do you guys get credit? Yeah, I don't think you guys know what happens. Apparently, your parents do it all for you. But yeah, you would get credit. And you would type in your code, and you would get like, I got $20 credit. This is great. And Telstra had one of these deals, and it was basically the bee's knees. This is, everyone was on Telstra, because Telstra had this deal that if you were texting other Telstra numbers, you would get one cent text. So every text would only cost you one cent. But if you texted non-Telstra numbers, every text was 25 cents. Oh, I know, a rip-off. So when you got your $20 credit for a couple of weeks, you, know, you knew that you had to be very careful which non-Telstra friends you texted. Because, I'll do the math for you, you could only get 80 non-Telstra friend texts for $20. But you could get 2,000 texts for, you know, like $20 for every Telstra number that you wanted to text. 2,000. And so you had to figure out, is this girl who isn't on Telstra really worth texting? Is she really worth 25 cents? You know, they were the big questions. Or do I just focus on the girl that's one cent? You know, like, which person do I really send my text messages to? They were the big questions. You had to ask those questions. Because phones were still a little bit of a novelty. And I don't know if you guys had this, but my parents, if I burnt through my $20 credit early, they didn't buy me more credit. Because there was home phones, there was pay phones. You have other ways of communicating. But... 
A mobile phone changed everything. I could text people and hang out, and you could have awkward moments where Ryan texts your mum that the hairdress is really hot instead of texting you, and then you have to deal with that because it's like, why are you guys talking about that stuff? It's like, good on, Ryan. Now you've got us in all sorts of trouble. But, you know, you have these sort of things happen. And you could just talk to people all the time. When I first left high school, I would leave school at the end of the day, and I wouldn't talk to anyone until the next day at school. And then I got a phone, and it was like... I was texting until like 10 o'clock at night, you know, past my bedtime, and mum and dad didn't know. You know, like all those sort of things that you guys still do too. Yeah, you're laughing because you know it's true. <laughs> that's why you guys are laughing. You're like, yeah, that's me, I do that. And seriously, it changed how I communicated with everyone. You could communicate all the time, you could communicate regularly, you could make phone calls, you could hear them on the other end of the line, you didn't have to talk to parents, you could just talk to each other. It was the dream. It changed everything. And you guys have no idea how good you've got it. The fact that you've had your phones for like since you were seven for some of you, like what the heck? You know, like you guys don't know how good you got it. Like you got iPads, you got like, you know, phones. Some of you might even have two phones because you got your burner and you also got, you know, like your general use phone. But you guys do not understand how good you have it. And we as people also don't understand how good we got it when it comes to prayer. You guys do ha not have any idea how good it is that we can pray the way that we can pray these days. You do not have any idea how good you got it. See, I don't know if you know this, but before Jesus, not everyone could talk to God. And you couldn't talk to God all the time. See, basically, you would have to go to the temple, perform some sacrifice, and then be able to, you know, sort of talk to God. That would be a part of your communication with God. God, I'm really sorry for what I've done. Would you please bless my crops? Here's a sacrifice so that maybe you'll listen to me, you know, if apparently it's good enough. Or the priest would come and be like, hey, you know, look, I feel like God wants to tell you this or, you know, something like that. Or you would have to, you know, meet or bump into a prophet for them to tell you about the Word of God. See, priests were like home phones. You know, you would go to the temple and you would know that there would be a priest there. Just like, you know, back when I was a kid, you would go to someone's home and you know they'd have a home phone. And prophets were kind of like, you know, the pay phones where they randomly pop up around the place and sometimes they got a message for you. Sometimes you have to ask them to give you a message. You know, it's kind of like, I'm not really sure what's going on. But these guys would come and give you messages. And these were the main ways that people would communicate with God. These were the main ways people would communicate with God. Couldn't just talk to him anytime. Basically, it was the same thing. If God, if you felt like God wanted you to do something, and you know, a prophet maybe told you, this is something that you need to do, and this is what God is asking you to do, you would just have to keep doing that. Just keep waiting, keep waiting, keep doing, keep doing, until you either got a message saying otherwise or you died. You know, like that was it. It's exactly like what it felt like waiting for Ryan to come down the tennis courts. You know, you're sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting and you feel like you're about to die. You know, like what's going on, Ryan? But that was the experience that people before Jesus had. You couldn't just talk to him all the time. Only certain people at certain times. And see, it wasn't a very sustainable way of doing it. Because the priests had to stay in the temple, worship God, learn his commandments, sacrifice things. You know, they're just constantly chopping heads off animals, boom, one after another, one after another. And that was what they had to do so that they could communicate with God and be in God's presence. That was literally what they had to do. That's a long process to be in God's presence. Then the prophets had to go through their own unique experiences. Does anyone know the prophet Isaiah? Yeah, hands in the air if you know the prophet Isaiah. Good. Now... I don't know if you know this, but if we go to Isaiah 6, and we've got verses 6 to 7, which should come up on the screen so you can see this. It says this, Then one of the seraphim, a seraphim is kind of like an angel, flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. Now, this is all a vision, just so you know. So this isn't like literally tongs happening and all this sort of stuff. And it says, With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Now, this happened because Isaiah had a vision of himself being in the presence of God. And he knew because he was a sinful person, he was about to die. See, God can't be in the presence of sin. And so Isaiah's sin had to be atoned for. I don't know why the cold touched his lips and, you know, I can imagine the blisters that you would get. But, you know, like, this was what happened so that um, Isaiah could be in the presence of God, experience God, and speak God's truth to others. That's an intense process. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't really sign up to be um, God's mouthpiece if it meant I had to get cold on my lips all the time. Like, it's not a pleasant experience. And while God's people felt distant from God because of this, can you imagine if you weren't able to talk to God, if you weren't able to talk to your friends, if you weren't able to talk to your family, you would feel distant from them. 
You wouldn't feel nice and close, nice and lovey. You would feel like there's someone who you don't really know and understand. And so while this was how the people felt relating to God, it's also how God felt relating to his people. You know, these are God's children, God's loved ones, and God couldn't regularly communicate and talk with them. There was obstacle after obstacle in their way. And this is not how God wanted it to operate. And so God did what God does best, and he removed every single obstacle. See, God sent Jesus to come and live and die so that our sin problem could be atoned for. So all of our sins, all of our guilt, all of our shame could be washed away and we could be considered righteous before God so that we could be in God's presence, so that we could have God speak to us directly. And the best way I can put this for us to understand what happened is kind of like this. Imagine for a second that I murdered someone. Actually, no, that's too violent. How about I stole a whole bunch of cars? That seems a bit more tame. I don't know if I could even pretend like I'd murdered someone. I stole a whole bunch of cars and I've ended up at court because I've stolen, you know, five Lamborghinis, three Ferraris and a couple of Teslas because, you know, save the environment. You know, so like I've done a whole bunch of this stuff. I get brought before uh, the court and the court finds me guilty, you know, you're going to jail. And they charge me with 20 years in jail. You know, like, that's a, that's a long punishment. I don't know if that's excessive for car theft, but, you know, that's a long time. Like, I wouldn't get out until I was 46, and then life's basically over by then anyway, isn't it? So, like, why come out? <laughs> don't tell your parents I said that. <laughs> it's how it feels. I mean, I'm 26 and my body's already fallen apart, so I can't imagine what it's like at 46. But I'd come out at 46, you know, that would be me. But not only would I come out at 46, but I would have a permanent mark on my record that says, Ben is a thief. Ben is a thief. Anytime I'd go for a job, they'd be like, oh, we see here that you stole like 10 or 12 cars. You're a thief. We're not going to hire you. That would be how I was known. So that would be not just my punishment, but my record, but also like how people would know me. That would be what I'm defined by. And you know what? Imagine being there, and that is what is about to be um, happening to you. You're about to get taken away in chains. And the judge, the judge who is able to judge you because they have right standing with the law. They've been given a certain righteousness and a certain power and a certain authority. They've never done anything wrong, never broken any law, broken any rule. And they say, stop. Before you take him away, I'm actually going to take Ben's punishment for him. I'm going to take those 20 years and I'm going to bear the cost. And not only that, mark it off his record and put it against my name. He's never a thief, he never stole. It will say that I went to jail for 20 years because I stole those cars. I'm the thief. And then he goes behind bars and you get to walk out. Well, in this case, I get to walk out of court a free man. No one ever knowing that I was a thief. Never having to deal with the punishment of my sin and rule breaking. And I'm able to go and live a righteous life back with my friends and my family. No one knowing or no one understanding that that had ever happened. That is what happened with Jesus and our sin. We'd done all of this stuff, and some of you know the, the pain and the guilt and the shame. You know it. We've done all this stuff that keeps us from God. There is a punishment that we can feel attached to it. And Jesus came, someone who hadn't done anything wrong, who didn't deserve that punishment, and took our punishment, took our record, wiped our slate clean so that we could have right standing with God. And because of that, because of that right standing with God, God has been able to give us a generous gift. See, when Jesus died, not only did he set us free from the pain and the um, punishment of sin, but he was able to give us his spirit. Now, the best way, I think, to describe God's spirit and how this sort of works is, you know a phone, like I said, we've been talking about phones all day, but you know when you get your phone, if you take the SIM out of it, it doesn't work. It's kind of like, you know, you can't use this phone, you can't receive any text messages. Some phones won't even let you log into it. Like, you literally cannot use it. Well, God's spirit is like the sim for our soul. So what it does is it's like God's spirit comes into our soul and all of a sudden we can send and receive messages to God. We can pray to God. We can hear what God has to say to us. Just like a phone when the sim goes in can send and receive text messages. God's spirit that has been given to us is what helps us communicate to God and to hear God communicate to us. That's what God's done. 
So God has done absolutely everything he possibly could. He knew that he couldn't talk to us all personally just over 2,000 years ago. And so he sent his son Jesus to die for us, to make us righteous, but also so that he could give us his spirit so that we can pray to him. This is a God who wants to speak to you. I don't know if you can see that, but he has done everything he possibly can to make it possible to speak to you because he wants to be someone that you call on all the time. He wants to be someone that you can talk to whenever you want. He is someone that anytime you're in need or anytime something great happens, you are talking to him. Just the same way that you'll shoot a text when you get a really good mark at school, or maybe you got into the, you know, that sporting team that you wanted, or maybe you got Justin Bieber tickets. You know, I would send a text out about that. You know, whatever it is, he wants you to communicate with him, and he has done everything he can to make it possible. God's heart behind prayer is for communication. God's heart behind prayer is communication with you, with me, with all of us, and with him. And the reason that we need to understand that is because for too many of us, prayer is a burden. We think prayer is an extra thing that we have to do, or we have to do a certain amount of prayer for God to love us. The truth is, God already loved us, and that's why he's made prayer possible. God already loved us, and that's why he made prayer possible. Because he wants to be close to you. He wants you to know him. He wants you to listen to him. He wants you to hear him. He wants to communicate with you. That is God's heart behind prayer. Not to burden you, but to love you. Not to make things difficult for you, but to make things easier for you. That is the heart behind prayer. And over the next few weeks, we're going to hear about how prayer has this incredible power behind it. And then we're going to look at some of the ways that Jesus, the Son of God, prayed and how he taught us to pray. And it's really going to, I believe, change how we view prayer and engage with prayer. But I hope today that you have understood that God wants to speak to you. That God has done whatever he possibly can to change your relationship with him. So that it's not one of distance where we have to go to others to hear from God. It's not one where we have to perform a whole bunch of sacrifices and rituals to hear from God. It's one where at any moment, any time, any place, we can talk to him. We can speak to him. We don't have to have the right credit amount. We don't have to have good reception. We can just talk to God whenever, however, with whoever, because God has made it possible, because God wants to speak with you. And so what I want to do is I want to invite Kalani up to just play a little bit of keys for us, is I want us to actually, in this moment, spend some time praying in with God. Because as I said, God has removed every single obstacle so that he can talk to you. And often what happens is we don't give him the time to speak to us. Often our prayers, you know, we shoot them up. We're like, hey, you know, God, you'd be great with this. And then we sort of move on. Just like, you know, if you just shoot a text at someone, you know, you're like, hey, just thought I'd let you know this cool thing happened. You don't really care whether they respond. In fact, sometimes you don't want them to. You just want them to think you're awesome. You know, you're like, this is something cool that happened. You know, that's what it is. And sometimes we forget to stop and listen. We forget to read the messages that God is sending to us. And so what I want us to do, because I firmly believe that God wants to do it too, is I want us to spend a moment communicating with God. So we're going to do this in two ways. The first thing we're going to do is I want you to just spend just 30 seconds just talking to God about a situation that you're facing, or maybe uh, something that a friend's going through, or maybe just your own relationship with God. You just want to talk to Him about that. You know, maybe things are going great and you just want to celebrate that with him. Maybe things are going a little bit tougher than you would have liked and you just want to bring that before him and say, God, this doesn't feel really fair or I just don't know what to do. Just bring that before him. And then what we're going to do is we're going to have a little time again, 30 seconds to a minute, where we're going to ask God to speak to us and we're just going to listen because I believe that he wants to speak to you this morning. He has a message for you. He wants you to know a whole bunch of stuff about what you're dealing with and what you're facing we've got to create that opportunity. So let's start. If we could just close our eyes and bow our heads, let's just pray. Whatever situation you're facing, whatever you're going through right now, just bring it before God. Just talk to Him about it.
right, maybe just like finish up your prayers, just bring in that situation before God. Obviously, you can continue that later if you want. Just, let's just stop and prepare ourselves to ask God to speak to us. See, so, um, just want to give you some, I guess, a little bit of advice because I know that sometimes what happens is we ask God to speak to us and we instantly start going, oh, was that God or was that me? Or was that God or was that me? Or we start listening to God and all of a sudden we're off on a tangent and we're thinking about how hungry we are and that hopefully we get Maccas for lunch on the way home. You know, like we start going on these tangents. And I just want to share with you guys a few things that I've learned that have helped me listen to God because I was just like you. I was someone, and in fact, I still am. I have an overly active mind. Just ask my wife. You know, I can be sitting next to her and we're talking about something and all of a sudden I'm off somewhere else thinking about something like that was related to that but wasn't and now bends on a tangent. So, you know, like that was my prayer life too. I would be like, God, you know, I just want to talk to you about something and I'd be off somewhere or I'd be like, God, speak to me and I'd be like, I don't know what that was but now I'm, you know, thinking about whatever. And I would miss little things that God was wanting to say to me because often what happens is, and I don't know if you've had this before, is we ask God to speak to us and we hear Him speak to us. We hear that inner voice just say something to us. And you always know it's God when it's encouraging, when it's hope-filled, and when it reminds you of who you are when He looks at you. You know, those are the key things that God will speak to you. God's a gentleman. He's not like the first thing. He's not going to be, you're a loser. That's not God. I can promise you that, okay? But God will say those things and then what happens is we begin to doubt that inner voice. We begin to start going, Oh, was that me or was that God? Oh, I think that's something that I would just like to hear. So no, that must have been me and not God. But if you're on camp, Michael talked about how when we have these things, we get these words or maybe you'll get a picture and we just sort of go, oh, I don't know if that's me or that's God. But if it fits that characteristic of like it's edifying, it's encouraging, and it's maybe how God sees me, you're going to be pretty safe. That's either God speaking to you or it's a really nice thought, you know, and like, We could all do with more nice thoughts in our head, I'm pretty sure, couldn't we? Like it's not a dangerous thing to give it a try. And so all we want to do is we just want to create a little bit of space and just ask God to speak to us. Now, when you do that, if you get a word that comes to mind really quickly or a picture that comes to mind really quickly, I'd encourage you to just take note of it, push into it. Maybe sometimes God wants to speak to you about something or even if you just take it and hold it, you know, that's it. But if any questions or doubts begin to come in, just like, all right, that's normal. That's what happens. You know, Ben's the pastor and I still have the exact same experience. It's just what it is to be human and try and discern the voice of God. So I just want you guys to know that. And uh, we're just going to spend a little moment just thinking uh, and reflecting and asking God to speak to us if there's anything He wants to share with us this morning, okay? So I'm going to pray and then we're going to sit for 30 seconds and ask God to speak to us. And that first thing that comes to your mind, capture it. And if it's encouraging, edifying or how God would see you, most likely that's from God, all right? Let's do this. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for your love and for your joy and for your uh, just passionate pursuit of us. But God, we want to thank you for the fact that you did all of this in Jesus, that you died on the cross so that you could speak to us. And God, I pray right now that you would. God, remove all distractions from our mind. Remove everything else that will just um, cause doubts or concerns. And Lord, speak to us these words this morning. Speak to us whatever it is that you want to say to us in Jesus' name. Father, we just want to thank you for the fact that you desire to speak to us. And God, I pray right now that you will have made really clear uh, anything it is that you wanted to say to us this morning. And God, I pray that we would be people who would understand your heart for prayer, Lord, that this isn't something that you want to burden us with, but something that you have gifted us with. It's an opportunity and an honor to be able to communicate with you and have you communicate with us. And God, I pray right now that we would understand that, that we would know that in our hearts and Lord, that that would draw us to you in prayer. And God, I pray that we would be people who would not just have one-way communication, but we would be people who would listen and have you speak to us and that you would encourage us and that you would remind us of who we are in you and that through what it is that you say, Lord, that you would lead us into your plans and your purpose and your will for our lives. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Hey, while I was just um, I was praying and I was asking God if there's anything He wants to say to to any of you or um, anything, and I didn't get a, anything for particular people, but I just felt like I got this word that just sat in the forefront of my mind. And again, I started going, "Oh, is that me or is that not me?" But classic. And then I was like, after I just told you guys not to do it, um, and then I was like, I just I'm like, "All right, I'm going to say it." I feel like God just wanted to remind some of you guys that you are His beloved. Now, this is a really like sort of old school world, but it's um, this word that people would use to describe the person that they were going to marry. You know, it would be like, this is my beloved wife, or this is my, you know, um, you know, you know, not that they're going to marry their children, but someone who's deeply connected to them, their beloved child. Someone who they, it's not just like love is enough, it's like to be beloved by them, like be loved, um, was kind of like uh, how, it, how it works. And so I just want you guys to know that God wants you to be loved by Him, to be His beloved. Um, and so I don't know if that's for any of you who are maybe just doubting whether God really loves you or whether God speaks to you. And maybe you just felt just then that God didn't speak to you and that's because, you know, you're like, He doesn't love me. Well, if that was you, I want you to know that God did speak to you and you are His beloved. That's what He wanted to say. So anyway, let me just pray again and um, because we can't pray too much. And then my encouragement is if there was something that you felt like maybe God spoke to you about, just talk to someone either next to you, like a friend or a leader, and just get some prayer around it. Just ask God to be like, God, I really want this word to speak to my heart and to my situations and to my soul. And there's nothing better than getting more prayer for it. So let me pray. Lord, we want to thank you for what has been said to us. And God, I pray right now that you would take these words and you would use them to shape us. And God, I pray that we would know them deeply. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen.